Welcome to St. Mary's College. My name is Molly Gower, and I serve as Interim Vice President for Mission. We are delighted to have about 800 people registered for the 35th Annual Madaliva Lecture. Though we gather virtually, we wish to acknowledge and honor the Native people and their traditional homelands on which we stand. We particularly recognize the Pokagon Band of the Potawatomi and the Miami, who have been utilizing this land and its resources for many years and who continue to do so today. With deep gratitude, we acknowledge the Native people and their culture within our community, as well as acknowledging the land upon which we gather, pray, learn, and work. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the 14th president of St. Mary's College, Dr. Katie Conboy, to offer some words of welcome. Welcome to St. Mary's College. The Madaliva Lecture is one of the most prestigious events on our calendar each year. Tonight is the 35th annual lecture, and we are delighted to welcome our speaker, Dr. Barbara Reed from Catholic Theological Union. This evening is always one of the finest examples of the intellectual vitality that exists on our campus. Since the days of our legendary third president, Sister Madaliva Wolf, CSC, St. Mary's has been known for bringing speakers and programming of the highest level to our community. The Madaliva Lecture continues this tradition, honoring a distinguished female theologian annually to highlight the vibrant voice of women in theology. Thank you for your presence tonight, and I hope that you leave inspired by Dr. Reed's lecture. I will now turn things back to Arlene Montevecchio to introduce our speaker. Thank you, President Conboy, and thank you all of you for being here tonight. My name is Arlene Montevecchio, and I am the director of the Center for Spirituality at St. Mary's College. The center was founded in 1984 with generous support from the Sisters of the Holy Cross many of whom are on the call tonight, and I wish to acknowledge them and extend my gratitude. As already mentioned, the Madaliva Lecture honors prominent women in theology who've made a substantial contribution to the field, not only with the lecture, but also with the subsequent publication of, the, of a book-length manuscript by Paulist Press, and we look forward to Sister Barbara Reed's publication. Following tonight's lecture, we will have 20 minutes or so of live question and answer time facilitated by the Associate Director of the Center. The chat box will open shortly after the lecture begins, and you can feel free to write your questions privately to the moderators. We will ask questions as time allows. It is now my great privilege to introduce the 35th Annual Madaliva Lecturer, Sister Barbara Reed. Sister Barbara E. Reed is the first woman religious to serve as president of Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. She is a Dominican sister of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and holds a PhD in biblical studies from the Catholic University of America, an MA in religious studies, and a BA from Aquinas College in Grand Rapids. She is professor of New Testament at Catholic Theological Union, where she has taught since 1988 and where she has also served as vice president and academic dean from 2009 to 2018. Sister Reed is past president of the Catholic Biblical Association of America, and she's the author of 10 books and numerous articles, including two commentaries on the Gospel of Luke in the Wisdom Commentary series, for which she is also general editor. The second of these commentaries on Luke is due out later this month. The Wisdom Commentary series is the first biblical series to be written entirely by feminist biblical scholars. Sister Reed is the recipient of many awards, 
the Aquinas College Hall of Fame, the Eve Conger Award for Theological Excellence from Barry University, the St. Martin de Porres Award from the Southern Province of Dominican Friars, the Jerome Award from the Catholic Library Association, and the Sophia Award from Washington Theological Union. Tonight's lecture is titled Dining at the Table of Holy Wisdom, Global Hungers and Feminist Biblical Interpretation. Sister Barbara Reed, welcome to St. Mary's College. Thank you very much, Arlene, and thank you so much, Dr. Convoy. It is such an enormous honor for me to be with you this evening for this 35th lecture, lecture honoring the pioneering vision of Sister Madeleva Wolf. As you know, she opened the first school of theology, the first one to be open to women in June of 1943. And for more than a decade afterward, this was the only place in the world where a lay person, male or female, religious or lay, could earn an advanced degree in Catholic theology. Such creativity and courage continue to inspire us as we face unprecedented challenges in our day. I want to begin to share my screen with you, a few images that I hope will help to concretize what I'm speaking about this evening. So Sister Madeleva is said to have been inspired by audacious women in the Old Testament. Perhaps among them was woman wisdom who invites all to her banquet. Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed, she says in Proverbs 9, 5 to 6. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. Eating at wisdom's banquet is an image for the nourishing teaching she offers, intended to guide those who partake of it into living wisely and well. And so we now come to wisdom's table famished after this exhausting time of worldwide pandemic, of gut-wrenching divisions in our country and throughout the globe, of heightened awareness of deep-seated racism, of the waves of desperate migrants and refugees, of peril for our planet. We hunger for well-being for all, for comfort after the losses, for oneness, justice, equity and inclusion for all peoples, for the flourishing of all creation. What regular attendees of this Madeleva lecture series will recognize is that those who are the hungriest and the most disadvantaged are women and children, mostly those of color. In this brief time we have this evening, I want to explore how feminist biblical interpretation gives us one of the many essential tools needed to alleviate these hungers. I will invite you to reflect with me first on how to prepare a menu for a feast with holy wisdom, and then on getting a place at the table, on seating arrangements, and finally on reshaping the table. First, preparing a menu. I want to offer you a cooking class. When people are starving, we cannot offer empty calories. Our scriptures offer rich, savory, filling fare if they're served properly. But there's also poison that we need to learn to identify and refuse to serve. Now, anyone can attend Woman Wisdom's cooking classes and learn to prepare a feminist banquet. First, though, let me clarify what I mean by feminism. By Sister, it, Reed, Sister Reed, did you want to share your slides? Are they not being shared? No, I apologize. Let's see what we can do. Is it something I need to do or something that you need to do? Okay, sorry. I think this is my... There we go. Thank you. How's that? Oh, thank you very much for alerting me. Yes, we can see them now. Thank you. Great. Thank you for thank you for um, alerting me to this. So, you know, there's a lot of different understandings of the term feminism. By it, 
I mean a perspective and a movement that springs from a recognition of inequities toward women and advocates for changes in structures, those structures that prevent full flourishing of all creation. Feminists recognize that not only gender, but race, class, and culture are all determinative factors that shape our experience and our understanding. To call attention to these differences, African-American feminists have adopted the term womanist. Similarly, Hispanic women use the term mujerista. Mujer, as you know, means woman in Spanish, or some prefer to call themselves Latina feminists. Ecofeminists call attention to the connection between justice for women and justice for earth. Now, men and those who identify in non-binary ways are also welcome in Holy Wisdom's culinary school. While they may not experience gender discrimination in the same way women do, they can choose to identify with and accompany us in learning to serve a feminist feast. So let's go into a feminist kitchen and learn to cook a banquet such as Woman Wisdom offers. As Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza has elaborated, there are seven basic steps. The first is to gather the essential ingredients that come from the experiences of women and other disadvantaged persons. One does not begin with the biblical text, but with real life. To acquire this ingredient, we need to pay attention to women's experiences of gender discrimination, as well as inequities based on race, culture, class, age, ethnicity, and other social markers. We reflect on the experiences of liberation as well and how those are fostered. Now there is no universal woman's experience. So this ingredient must be gathered from women in many different contexts around the globe. The second step is to identify one's social location and to recognize how that influences what one sees in lived reality and in the biblical text. For example, do you remember Matthew's parable of the workers in the vineyard that Matthew tells in chapter 20 of his gospel? I want to propose that a person of privilege will likely identify with the laborers who worked all day long in the hot sun and then may struggle with questions of entitlement and perceived injustice when the owner decides to pay everyone the same amount at the end of the day. However, a person with few professional skills who struggles to get meaningful work may identify rather with the last hired and might hear in the parable a reassuring message that God's beneficence is freely given to all and is not something earned. A third step is to question the origin of the biblical text as it has been handed on to us. Who wrote it and for whom? Where? In what contexts? With what intent? Now, unfortunately, our biblical books don't come with identifying labels that will answer these questions with complete assurance. We can make some approximations, but most important from a feminist perspective, is to acknowledge that the various books of the Bible have been written for the most part by men, for men, about men, and to serve men's interests. In addition, until recent decades, most of the biblical commentaries, sermons, and Bible studies have been produced by white Western educated men. So their perspectives have shaped how it has been handed on. So therefore, we ask questions that try to unearth what were the experiences of women and other disadvantaged persons in biblical times? How would they have told the story? A fourth step is to evaluate the rhetorical effect of the text. Who is nourished by the text and who is left hungry? Does acceptance of the text lead to flourishing of life? Or does it uphold systems of domination and oppression? For example, Paul's admonition in, in Colossians 3.18, 
wives be submissive to your husbands, can be taken to heart by a woman who is in, a, in an abusive relationship and she may understand the text as divine justification telling her to submit meekly to beatings by her partner rather than trying to stop the violence. Clearly, interiorizing such a message is contrary to the liberating message Jesus proclaimed. A feminist cook would challenge the hierarchical household model accepted unquestioningly in Paul's day, which is no longer serving in contemporary societies where spouses work to, toward equitable sharing of household responsibilities and authority. In a fifth move, woman wisdom invites her pupils to unleash all their powers of creative imagination to dream of a world in in which equity and dignity is there for all. Being able to envision such a world then gives the energy to create it. Drama, art, music, dance, storytelling, and ritual all help to unleash the creative powers that can move us from dreaming to actuality. A sixth ingredient is not only to envision a new future, but to retrieve the past. We use all the best tools of historical critical exegesis to reconstruct women's experience from biblical times, remembering that women have always been central to discipleship and mission. We bring forward women who are in the text who have been overlooked or forgotten as well. When women are not mentioned, we continually ask, where were they and what was their experience? When women are mentioned, such as Phoebe, deacon of the church at Cancrie in Romans 16.1, for example, and Junia, notable among the apostles, Romans 16.7, we surmise that they are merely the tip of the iceberg, that there must have been many more women deacons and apostles whose names are now lost to us. Another important strategy is to distinguish between descriptive and prescriptive. For example, when Paul says women should be silent in the churches, in, as he does in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, we recognize that he is prescribing what he wants to happen, not describing actual practice. For we see from chapter 11 of the very same letter that women did speak in the assembly prophesying and praying without censure. A feminist cook would want to investigate what kinds of speech are acceptable to whom in the assembly and which are not, and who wanted the women to be silent and why. Now retrieval of the stories and traditions that are laudatory of women and other disadvantaged persons is very important, but just as important is the remembrance of the texts of terror, as Phyllis Tribble so aptly named, biblical stories that describe and seem to accept and even laud unspeakable violence toward women, such as the abuse and dismemberment of the unnamed concubine of the Levite in Judges 19. At first, we might be tempted to erase and bury such stories, never tell them again. But a feminist liberative, liberative approach urges us to remember and repeat them, not to per perpetuate their brutality, but to expose such tales for what they are and to insist never again. The final step is to take action toward transformation. Feminist biblical interpretation is far more than an intellectual exercise. Having begun with analyzing women's realities, it comes full circle to take actions that will impact those realities, trying to correct injustices. Such actions work for change on two levels, in personal relationship patterns and on the systemic level to work to dismantle structures that keep domination and inequity in place. These seven ingredients of feminist biblical interpretation 
can give us a basic recipe, but they are not a formula that, if followed exactly, will give us a correct or liberative meaning, meaning once and for all. Biblical interpretation is an art, and the recipes and the meals must be adapted to each context. Shifting metaphors for a moment, Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza likens the seven steps to those of a dance, where the steps interweave one another in various patterns. It is a lively tango that can energize us for a new world and church. One caution, however, woman wisdom's feast is not just a spicier or more tasty version of what's been served up before. Woman wisdom would not have us just add woman and stir. Rather, a whole new way of cooking, serving, and ingesting is needed. A retraining of the taste buds, where any vestiges of biblical interpretation that exalts clericalism or domination and submission or violence toward defenseless persons, creatures, or earth are spat out as the poisons we no longer are able to consume. So now we're ready to come to the table. Feminists today use the expression, getting a place at the table, to speak about the necessity for women to be included in the places where important decisions and discussions are taking place. Not only in the church, but in business, politics, and all other arenas of power from which women have been excluded, there are persistent calls for women to take their place at the table. In March of 1943, Sister Madaliva, in her ninth year as president at St. Mary's College, was appointed to head a subcommittee of the National Catholic Education Association to, to address the problem of Catholic sisters being asked to teach religion, but without proper preparation. No university would accept them into their theology programs. Only priests need apply. And so Sister Madaliva created St. Mary's School of Theology for women to get a place at the table. We see in our day, small but not insignificant advances. On January 20th, 2021, the first female woman of color was sworn in as vice president of the US. In February of this year, Sister Natalie Bechwart was, was appointed to serve as undersecretary at the Vatican Synod of Bishops. And Katya Sumaria was appointed to serve in March of this year as prosecutor in the Vatican Court of Appeal. As well, that month, Sister Nuria Kalduch Benajis was appointed as secretary of the Pontifical Biblical Commission. These are just a few of the increasing number of women who are breaking the stained glass ceilings year after year. Yet there remain many tables that boast signs with reserved for men, or better, for ordained celibate men only. Some of the reasons for exclusion of women rest on inadequate or even faulty interpretations of the Bible. Despite decades of work by feminist biblical scholars and theologians, in the minds of many Christian believers, the only ones who accompanied Jesus throughout his earthly ministry and to whom he entrusted the mission after his death were the 12 male apostles. And in the imaginations of many Christians, only the 12 men were at the table with Jesus when he shared the Last Supper with them, where he supposedly ordained them. The Gospels give us a different picture. In all four, Galilean women disciples follow Jesus to Jerusalem, where they witness the crucifixion, see the place where he was buried, discover the empty tomb, and are the first to be entrusted with the good news. In Matthew and John, it is the risen Christ himself who appears directly to them and commissions them. In Mark, Matthew, and John, these women disciples do not appear until the end of the story. But Mark and Matthew make it clear that they have been there all along. Mark says, 
Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Younger and of Josie's and Salome used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. That's Mark chapter 15, verse 40 and 41. The language of following, serving, and being with Jesus is language that signals discipleship. And the verbs ekoluthon and diakonun are in the imperfect tense, meaning the following and ministering were ongoing repeated actions. I want to call attention to how faulty translations and mistaken notions of what was proper for women in Jesus's day can prevent us from understanding that women did have a place at the table and at times were even at the head. When the NRSV translates the verb diakonun in Mark 15, 41 as provided for, it falsely reinforces the notion that women provided food, clothing, or other domestic support for Jesus and the male disciples. The verb is more correctly translated, ministered, or served. Throughout the New Testament, the verb diakonein and the noun diakonia refer to the ministerial services of very many kinds, financial ministry, leadership, apostolic ministry, ministry of the table, of the word, and the whole of Paul's ministerial service twice is called diakonia in Acts of the Apostles. So when the Galilean women are said to have been ministering, diakonhun, we can envision their service as including any or all of these functions. Let's talk about seating arrangements. We see from many New Testament texts that women did have a place at the table in the Jesus movement and in the early church. But where were they seated at the table? Many have the mistaken notion that women never sat at the table. They only prepared and served the meal. Now, let me pause to say that preparing and serving the meal is also of critical importance. A great illustration of this is Jesus's parable of the woman who hides yeast in three measures of flour until all of it is leavened. And Jesus says this is an image for how God's basileia is manifest in the work of baker women. Baking by women has never been called into question. The way that having a place at the table at the head, for example, has. So let's return to that topic. There are abundant New Testament references to women who were at the head of the table, metaphorically and perhaps literally. Women like Mary, mother of John Mark in Jerusalem, Lydia in Philippi, Nympha in Colossae, Prisca in Corinth, Martha in Bethany, Phoebe in Cancrie, hosted and likely presided over the celebrations of the Lord's Supper in the gatherings of believers in their homes. As hosts, these women would have selected the menu, would likely have pronounced the ritual words of blessing over the bread and the cup. And since women were the managers of households, even when the leader of the, the assembly may have been a male, as Lynn Osick observed, to step into a Christian house was to step into women's world. I wonder how the female hosts of house churches would have heard Jesus's teaching in Luke 14, 12 to 13, when Jesus said, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. In a number of New Testament texts, women, especially widows, are said to be particularly attentive to the needs of those who were poor. Tabitha, for example, was said to be devoted to good works and acts of charity, as Acts 9.36 tells us. In 1 Timothy 5.10, qualifications for the ministry of widow include this, she must be well attested for her good works as one brought up, who has brought up children, 
shown hospitality, washed the saints' feet, helped the afflicted, and devoted herself to doing good in every way." End quote. I wonder if it may have been that women hosts who had less social capital to lose than the men in the early Jesus movement, might the women have found it easier to extend their concern for those who were needy into table companionship with them, as Luke 14 advises. The reality of women being at the table and some being in the place of honor at the head is often overshadowed by stories in the gospels where women are not at the table or where their leadership is contested. For example, in the story in Luke's gospel in chapter seven of the woman who comes into the banquet of Simon the Pharisee and pours out her expensive ointment and her tears on Jesus's feet as an extravagant act of love and thanksgiving for having been released from her sins. This text shows a woman who is not a participant in the banquet, but an uninvited guest and an object of discussion. She is not at the table, but behind Jesus at his feet as he is reclining. And in the vignette in Luke's gospel in chapter 10 with Martha and Mary, the place Mary chooses as a silent learner at Jesus's feet is upheld as the better part, while Martha's choice of diaconal service is discouraged. The opening verse says that Martha welcomed Jesus into her home, hinting that she is the head of the house and likely the teacher and leader of the group of believers that meet there. Martha is worried about much diaconia, most likely referring to public ministries that men like Luke think should be left to the male disciples. The image that Luke wants us to have is that women belong at the feet, not the head, silently learning, but not taking the lead in interpreting, preaching, and evangelizing. And in Luke's Last Supper scene, only the apostles, whom Luke equates with the 12 males named in Luke 9, are at the table. A much different version of the story is found in the Gospel of John. In that Gospel, there is no calling or sending of the 12. Instead, disciples, Matetai, a diverse group of women and men followers, are mentioned more than 70 times. These are Jesus's own, whom he loves to the end, as John 13, 1 tells us. Prime among them is the beloved disciple who is never named, a figure that allows any disciple, female or male, to insert herself into that place of the follower who is closest to Jesus. The, the beloved disciple is the one reclining at the bosom of Jesus, according to Luke, thir uh, sorry, John 13, 23, at the Last Supper. And the phrase there is that the beloved disciple, not as the NRSV translates it as reclining next to him, but rather the phrase in Greek, entokolpo tu Jesu, is an expression that literally says at the breast of Jesus. And it recalls the intimacy of the father and the son described in the prologue of the gospel. In John 1.18, it describes the only son at the father's breast, that very same expression, eistan kolpan tu patras. Notice there's a bit of bending, gender bending there with the father with a breast and Jesus having the beloved disciple at his breast. The image is that of a nursing child at its mother's breast. The intimacy that the son experiences with the father, as expressed in John 1.18, is the same intimacy that the, any disciple can experience at the breast of Jesus. At the table in John's gospel, in the Last Supper scene, all Jesus's own, female and male, are there, and any can be in the place of honor at Jesus's breast. Notice in this gospel, it is not Peter who is at the head. 
A counter message is heard, however, in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 14, verses 7 to 24, where Jesus discourages disciples from taking the place of honor at a banquet, a message that many women have internalized. In that text, Jesus criticizes the dining practices whereby guests are seated by rank. At banquets, the host and guests would recline on couches or mats on their left sides, using their right hand to reach the table in the center. The U-shaped three-sided table, a triclinium, was meant to provide equal access to the food, conversation, and entertainment. But in fact, each position at the table was assigned and all the guests immediately knew their rank in relation to the others. To be asked by the host to move after taking a place designated for a more honored guest would be a humiliating disgrace. Far better, Jesus advises, is taking the lowest place so that the host will invite you to move up higher. Many women take this message to heart and think it is prideful to seek a prominent place at the table. It is critical, however, to keep in mind step number two in Holy Wisdom's cooking class, to be cognizant of one's social location before taking to heart Jesus's admonitions to take the last place and to humble oneself. <clears throat> Jesus in Luke 14 is addressing guests of a prominent Pharisee who are socially well positioned. They can afford to take a humble place. Not so those who are customarily humiliated and excluded. The teaching in Luke 14, 11 concludes, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Reversal of status is a theme that resounds throughout the third gospel, beginning with Mary's Magnificat, where she praises God for bringing down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up all those who are humiliated and for filling the hungry with good things and sending the rich away empty. Feminists, however, caution. Status reversal does not result in equity. If unequal power structures remain in place, only the characters change. Rather, as Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza advanced, to arrive at a community of equal disciples where all have an equitable place at the table, strategies of empowerment are needed to raise up those at the bottom of domination systems, while those at the top need to relinquish power, privilege, and status. Very frequently in Luke, Jesus is portrayed as a participant in a meal, sometimes as a guest, other times as host. Luke paints these scenes as typical Greco-Roman style symposia, where there is a, the dinner and then an extended discussion and entertainment afterward. Women, though present at Greco-Roman banquets, Jewish Passover seders and Christian Eucharists are never portrayed in Lucan scenes of symposia as interlocutors in the discussion after the meal. It is true that some women who attended banquets would take their leave after the meal and not participate in the symposium that followed, but many Roman women of the upper class were well-educated and were able inter interlocutors in philosophical discussions. We know about this from numerous examples in Greco-Roman literature where such women were criticized and some even characterized as prostitutes. But we also know of at least one example of a first century Jewish monastic community in Alexandria, where women called the Therapeutae, described by Philo, had both men and women participants in meals together, as well as in the after dinner proceedings. The women and the men reclined with a partition between them, but it did not reach the ceiling. The segregation allowed for the women to participate in the symposium while also preserving their reputation for chastity. While women clearly hosted early Christian assemblies and likely pronounced the blessing over the cup and the bread, the role of teacher at the symposium following the meal was another matter. 
At Greco-Roman banquets, someone other than the host, such as a noted philosopher or a person trained in rhetorical skills, was often invited to speak after the meal. In Christian assemblies, the teacher would have reflected on the scriptural texts that were read, expounding on their meaning and giving spiritual guidance or living them out. In Luke's depictions of meal scenes, there are no women who participate in the table talk, much less take the role of teacher. Luke upholds the ideal of a silent, submissive Greco-Roman matron, discouraging women from taking up roles of teacher and preacher. Although he does slip one reference to a powerful teacher in Acts of the Apostles, who even uh, took on a very notable teacher named Apollos in Alexandria. So feminists recognize that Luke is telling only part of the story when he leaves women out of the symposia and out of the roles of teacher and preacher. He is telling the story slant. And so we must try to unearth the rest of the story and look to its potential for nourishing a church wherein all have a place at the table, where women are just as able as men to be at the head and are recognized as authoritative interpreters of the scriptures and wise spiritual guides. As we're picturing the table, I suggest that some of our Christian art has done us a disservice, both in giving us false depictions and stymieing our imagination. Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, for example, has both the shape of the table and the guest list wrong. Jesus and the Twelve would not all have been on one side of a long table as if to say, all you guys who want to be in the picture, come on over to this side of the table. Dinner tables for more formal events in Jesus's day, as we have seen, would have been three-sided triclinia. We might ponder how would holy wisdom shape her table? Would it be long and square with a clear head and foot and ranked seating? I rather think not. What if it were round, where there was no head or foot, where all had an equal place, even though with distinct roles? Decades ago, Letty Russell elaborated what a church in the round might look like and how it might function a circular table around which the most disadvantaged people of the world are gathered in response to an open and inclusive hospitality. The fourth gospel comes closest to giving us an idea of how this could be. In that gospel, there is no group of 12 men who become the lead apostles. All are beloved disciples, friends of Jesus, a relationship that implies equality in status. In John's gospel, Peter is not given the keys to the kingdom, and it is Martha who makes the, declar the declaration of Jesus as Messiah. In the community of the beloved disciple, women play other key roles. Jesus's mother helps birth Jesus's public ministry at Cana and is among the women at the foot of the cross who act as midwives, if you will, in rebirthing the community to carry on Jesus's mission. The Samaritan woman is the model apostle, bringing her townspeople to belief in Jesus. Mary of Bethany prefigures Jesus's washing of the feet of his disciples by anointing his feet. Mary Magdalene, in coming alone to the tomb, represents the whole community of believers as she is the first to encounter the risen Christ and to be commissioned to proclaim the good news. As Sandra Schneiders has observed, all these point to the reality that there were women evangelists, prophets, teachers, apostles, ministers, hosts, leaders in that community of believers. Because you don't tell the story that way unless there are actual women in the community who are performing these roles. In calling for a table of a different shape, we recognize that deep structural change is needed. It will not do 
just to invite women to the current tables. The structures of church and ministry themselves need radical reshaping by wisdom's friends. In the brief time we've had tonight, I feel like we've only gotten to the appetizers. If I left you hungry for more, there are many good resources that serve up hearty, satisfying feminist fare to which I hope you'll turn. Would it be shameless of me to suggest the Wisdom Commentary series, the first full-blown biblical commentary series written entirely by feminists, uh, for which I am the general editor, or my book, Wisdom's Feast, that contains a few more recipes. I'd also like to invite you to explore the courses, the Summer Institute offerings, the free lectures that are available through CTU. Just go to our website, ctu.edu, and there you can find what's coming up next. I, what I hope you will take away tonight is greater confidence in your own cooking ability as a feminist biblical interpreter who can serve up a feast akin to that of woman wisdom. Once you've got the basic ingredients and have tasted this kind of banquet, my hope is that any interpretations that are misogynistic or curiarchal become unpalatable and no longer tolerable. For our starving world, only nourishing fare that intends the flourishing of all life on the planet will do. Almost eight decades ago, Sister Madaliva forever changed the face of Catholic theology. If one woman listening to the promptings of holy wisdom could do that, imagine what all of us together can do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Barbara. Um, you've given us so much nourishment this evening, and that's uh, evidenced by the number of really rich questions that we have in the chat. Uh, so the chat is still open for you to post questions, anyone who would like to post one. Um, we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, we have several themes that are going through the questions, so I may group some in that way. Uh, we have one, I'd like to start with one that goes back to the beginning and at the end, which is really talking about art. You had so many beautiful, we had several messages about the beautiful images that you used in your presentation and thanking you for, for um, including art that's shaped our Catholic ministerial imagination. Um, there's a question about the, the be beginning image that you used on your feminism slide, asking if you could share the artist and or title of the image on that slide in particular. I'd be happy to. The, uh, the artist is Sister Mary Southard. Uh, she's a sister of St. Joseph from LaGrange, Illinois. And I'll have to look just a second at the image. It's called What We May Be is the title of the image. Oh, fascinating. Thank you. And I think you can, um, I think you can Google that and pull it up on the on the internet if you'd like to contemplate it further. Um, Mary has been very generous in giving me permission to uh, use her work widely in presentations. And, um, and actually, the, it, you might have noticed on the cover of Wisdom Commentary Series, um, the image there of the, the three women uh, in, in a circular dance, Those, uh, that's an adaptation of one of her images as well. Wonderful. Um, I want to, thinking of those images, using the image of feasting, I want to pose a question by one of our St. Mary's College students. She asks, why does using the language or metaphor of cooking and feasting matter? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I, a few things about that metaphor is, um, first of all, I think there's a uh, there, there are a number of images presented to us in the New Testament, as I've tried to draw out this evening, that can draw on that image. But what, what I hope uh, can matter from a feminist perspective is that it helps to move us from thinking that women only cook the meal 
to women at, or serve the meal, but women also are the ones, if we, if we stay with the metaphor of serving the meal, um, that means that that also entails the serving up of the, the word that is broken open, serving up of the, um, the Eucharistic mystery that we share. Um, and, and so trying to move into um, ministerial leadership is uh, that that metaphor also, also breaks open. And so uh, it's also a metaphor that the very word for ministry, um, diakonia, uh, stretches into because diakonia does mean table service, but it also, as I showed earlier, it also refers to all different kinds of ministry, financial ministry and, and um, ministry of the word, ministry of the table, um, apostolic ministry. So um, stretching us to think of women in all of those ministries. Um, they were in the early church. We have plenty of evidence in the New Testament and in the early church and have been all through our, all through Christian history. And so um, uh, trying to cook up ways in which we break open the uh, reserved tables uh, to new realities for today. Beautiful. There's another similar question about the table asking about um, about the dinner table of the Eucharist. Um, how can um, we influence the word delivered Sunday after Sunday in the preaching when women are not invited to the pulpit to the dinner table? Um, which... That's a tough one. And especially for, uh, I, as you know, I'm a Dominican, so a member of the order of preachers. So it, that's, that's a tough one um, when that table still has a reserved sign on it that excludes women. There are opportunities for women to preach at non-Eucharistic celebrations. And, um, and I always um, try myself and urge others, whenever you get that kind of in invitation, um, take it, never say no. Um, I, I also, um, uh, I also want to say that there are many resources available. So one is catholicwomenpreach.org. And every Sunday, we have marvelous women who are breaking open the word for us in, in fabulous ways. And so to supplement our nourishment with, uh, with what we find there and other spaces where women are preaching and sharing their preaching electronically. Thank you um, for that reminder. Yes, Catholic Women Preach is a wonderful resource uh, for the church. Uh, Emily, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I forgot to plug in my computer and it's losing power and it will take me one minute to go get my plug. <laughs> Please excuse me one moment. Certainly. Certainly. Um, while we wait, we do have several um, questions here lined up. I don't know that we'll have time for all of them, um, but we do encourage you. I wanna let you know um, that if you have friends who you think may be interested in this uh, wonderful presentation from Sister Barbara Reed, we are recording this. Uh, we will be processing the recording and editing it and posting it to our YouTube channel, the Center for Spirituality website and posted to our Facebook page. So please look for that in the coming days if you would like to share this, this rich nourishment with others who may be interested as well. Um, oh, wonderful. Uh, so many wonderful questions. I'm scrolling through here to make sure I can uh, try to get as many as we can and, and get them kind of grouped group together. Let's talk a little bit more about um, feminist biblical scholarship. Um, several questions around that, around maybe the, the evolution. How have you seen the feminist biblical interpretation evolve over time? How prevalent is it in places like seminaries? Um, and uh, there was another question about about specifically Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza's method. Um, is she still the standard um, of new scholars? What have new scholars contributed that maybe have, have moved in different directions? 
That's a great cluster of questions. And um, so the evolution, uh, feminist biblical scholarship is nothing new. Since we have, um, we have evidence that women from the earliest days of Christian believers were already uh, thinking for themselves and reading um, with, I, I love this expression that the women's Bible study groups in the Diocese of San Cristobal de las Casas in Chiapas use, they use the expression of reading the Bible con ojos, mente y corazón de mujer, with the eyes, mind, and heart of a woman. And so reading from women's experiences, um, seeing something different than their male counterparts see in the text. And so, um, so that act of reading with the mind, eyes, and heart of a woman is not new. What is newer is that it's only in recent decades that women have had access to formal theological and biblical education and have then been able to um, join our male colleagues at the table in, academic, uh, in the academic arena. Um, and so, but it has evolved greatly. One of the things that um, we can see over the history of feminist biblical interpretation is that our, our forebears, many of them kept repeating, having to reinvent the wheel because they didn't have access to what other women had said or, or um, interpretations they had espoused earlier. Um, now we can build on what our sisters have uh, done and seen before us. Um, just in terms of evolution that I've seen in my lifetime, um, when I first became more cognizant of feminism and then feminist biblical interpretation, um, I gravitated toward, and you'll see this in the book that I published in 1986, uh, sorry, 96, um, called uh, Choosing the Better Part, Women in the Gospel of Luke. You'll see that what I did is I took every story in the Gospel of Luke that had a female character and I analyzed that from a feminist perspective. What, um, what was missing from that approach is that feminists now, uh, and, and I was not alone in doing it, lots of us were pulling out the women and saying, oh, look, here are the women and let's, let's analyze the text that have the women in it and uh, see how this can help us. Um, but over, over the next decades, there was a very strong shift to looking at the entire text, not just the passages that had women in them, but the entire text and say, how would women have heard this text? Are women reflected in this text? Is their experience represented? If not, what would have been their experience? What might their reaction have been? And so, for example, um, in uh, Mark's gospel in the middle of chapter eight, where Jesus says to his disciples, if any um, of you are to become my disciples, then you must um, deny yourself, take up your cross and come follow me. And so examining how have women heard and interiorized taking up the cross? Um, so that's what I did in the, in the next book I wrote after women in the gospel of Luke is looking at looking at how texts that talked about the cross, how did women interiorize those and how, what were some of the uh, very dangerous directions that that, that that could be interiorized in ways that reinforced violence and victimization toward women, but, and what were the liberative ways to, um, to appropriate those texts um, that try to break cycles of violence and victimization. So that's, a, that's a, also what we're trying to do in Wisdom Commentary series is um, bring feminist eyes, mind and heart to the whole of the text and not just the text where women are, are present. Um, and as to the question about how, uh, oh, and, and let me also say that um, in terms of how the method has continued to evolve, I, I always feel like I have to cite Elizabeth Schisler Fiorenza because she was such a groundbreaking pioneer. Um, but whoever was asking about further developments beyond Schisler Fiorenza, yes, indeed. And if we only had more time, I would elaborate uh, more fully. But one of the things that that 
I, I did mention is that we now are trying to pay much more attention to, um, to the experiences of diverse women in every context all around the globe. So at the outset, those who had education and could begin to do the, the important thinking to elaborate methods of feminist biblical interpretation were for the most part, white European and North American women who, had, um, who, who were privileged enough to have an education. Now, now we're very cognizant that it matters, um, race matters, social status matter, matters, level of education matters. And so, and so um, feminists, womanists, um, mujeristas, Latina feminists, Asian feminists, Native American feminists, um, eh, feminists from the South Pacific, um, echo feminists, we all try to talk to one another and to develop our methods out of our particular contexts and share those with one another. Um, women embedded in the LGBTQ plus community, um, very important dialogue partners in this endeavor as we, as we continue to develop methods that, that, um, that reflect our experience, speak to our experience, and then take us beyond. Um, in terms of how prevalent feminist biblical interpretation is, um, I would have to say that on the one hand, I am greatly heartened that it is far more prevalent um, than it was even 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, when I uh, first dreamed up the, the wisdom commentary series, I wasn't sure if there were enough feminist biblical scholars to be able to pull off something like this, where we were going to treat all 72 books of the Bible. And not only did I need 72 lead authors, but I also needed to have a whole array of other voices in each volume because my idea was that there is no one feminist biblical interpretation of any text. And so I was convinced that the commentary would be far richer if it included a whole array of diverse voices. So every volume has, in addition to the lead author or authors, a number of the volumes are co-authored, um, but in addition to the lead authors, um, every volume has, uh, has uh, comments that are set in, in, in grayscale inset um, to give another point of view on the same text. Now, sometimes the person is um, agreeing with the main authors, but oftentimes not, and oftentimes uh, offering a very different perspective from his or her particular context. Um, and so we have tried to engage dialogue partners from all around the, the globe to be able to um, enrich the feast that we're offering there. So much to my delight, quite a large percentage of new biblical scholars are trained in feminist methods and um, claim feminist methods as one of their areas of expertise. So I had no trouble getting enough authors for the series. Um, how prevalent is it in seminaries and schools of theology? Uh, well, as the number of feminist biblical scholars grows, uh, so we are passing that on to our students, whether we, whether we identify that that's what we're doing or not. Sometimes it helps not to say what it is you're serving. If you knew what you were eating, you might not swallow it. <laughs> so sometimes, uh, sometimes, you know, we serve up feminist biblical interpretation and students get enthused about it. And um, afterwards, if somebody asks them, well, you know, you know, that was feminism that she was teaching you on. It was, oh, really? You know, well, I just thought it was Christianity. You know, that, that's my aim, is that it becomes so normative that it doesn't have to have a special label anymore. Um, I, do, I did do a survey of my colleagues who teach biblical studies in uh, Roman Catholic schools of theology and, and ministry around the U.S. a couple of years ago. And much to my, um, much to my surprise that 
uh, the majority said that they do introduce their students to feminist biblical interpretation. Now, I didn't probe far enough to ask how much do you introduce them to it? Is it a one hour, um, you know, bare bones, uh, here's the basic recipe and then set it aside and carry on like, like normal? Or do, is it a more sustained, um, a, a more sustained uh, introduction into feminist ways of of um doing biblical interpretation that i don't know and uh that that will take a little bit more study to find out yes um yeah i was fortunate to be able to to study with uh, mary rose d'angelo and do some feminist uh interpretation of scripture with her uh, I, I have a follow-up question about that though when you talk about being in dialogue with women um, who are um, Latina, who are LGBTQ, um, where is that happening? Where is that dialogue happening? Oh, all over. It's, um, it's happening in grassroots groups of women gathering to reflect on scriptures. It's happening, um, it, it's certainly, in terms of my, my own scholarly exchanges, it happens in the academy. Um, I, I wouldn't miss a meeting of the Catholic Biblical Association or the Society of Biblical Literature. And both of those meetings have, um, have set sections that are, uh, and working groups um, with, uh, well, CBA is much smaller. So there's, there's one group of feminist uh, biblical hermeneutics, a working group, um, but it's a very diverse group with women from very uh, different races and cultures and, uh, and different contexts. In, uh, in the SBL, which is a huge organization, there are individual sessions for, um, for Latina feminist biblical interpretation, for a womanist in, a feminist interpretation, for Asian American, for, for et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, so I try to take in as many as I can and and then it's in those kinds of contexts when we meet each other and when we're in exchange with one another that then we also make links to work on projects together. That's wonderful. Part of the reason I ask that is we're on a college campus here and we value dialogue greatly. Uh, and uh, there's a question specifically for geared toward young women um, or geared toward college students. Um, what advice would you give to college age women who are tired and impatient with the lack of change in the church towards women, LGBTQ folks, and others, people who are on the margins, I guess we could say. Yeah. I think what I would advise is um, something that I found has worked for me, is that in order for me to have the patience to stay in the church that is not changing fast enough in terms of the dynamics that we're talking about here tonight. Um, it has helped me enormously to be connected with circles of women who, where, uh, where we share our faith, where we share our struggles, where we support one another. Uh, so I have one circle of women friends that uh, we've been together, gosh, about 25 years now. Uh, where we meet regularly to uh, and and we take turns preparing prayer um, and then reflecting on the on the scriptures and then share a meal together and so um, so it's it, it's not Eucharist but it's something like what we do at Eucharist when we share the word and reflect on it and 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 share a meal um, but it's um, but that is a really strong help for me. There are also, um, there's also a circle of women. It, it's um, suspended at the moment, but uh, at CTU where I teach, um, for a number of years, we had um, what we called women in ministry. And we would do a similar kind of thing that I just described where anyone at the school, um, faculty, staff, uh, or students, uh, could gather and uh, and we did restrict it to women um, and we called it women in ministry and about two dozen would gather every month and people would take turns uh, preparing the the prayer and leading the uh, reflections 
and everybody would bring something to contribute to the meal. And those kinds of places for us to express our, our hopes and our dreams, to share our interpretations, how we understand the scriptures, um, to share the scriptures of our lives with one another, um, our joys and our struggles. Um, those, those kinds of gatherings have been what sustain me. And, um, and for me, of course, as a member of a women's religious community, um, I, I don't think I could still survive without my Dominican sisters. And so um, it's, it, it's those kinds of circles of other women who are sharing the same kinds of struggles that have helped me to, um, uh, to continue to navigate in, in, um, in our church. I, um, I do think that um, it is getting hard to stay patient. We've been talking about this for a long time. So that uh, taking those actions that are going to help uh, bring about the change is just really critical not to get weary into and to um, buoy each other up and keep on insisting and and not give up. There are a number of questions that really relate to that notion of um, impatience, struggle with remaining in the church, struggle with um, uh, yeah, suggestions for structural change that's needed uh, to take place in the church. So um, there are quite a few along those lines. And I think uh, many of us maybe are familiar with these kinds of questions. So I really appreciate you um, offering your wisdom for sustenance, um, a type of nourishment that will keep us going. Um, I will ask, we have just a very short bit of time left. Um, if there's something you would like to conclude with, there's one question about that was interesting about um, restoring women to the diaconate, that there's a continuing official investigation of the possibility of inclusion of women in the diaconate. And there, as someone is asking, should we hold out hope? Could that bear fruit? <laughs> Um, I will, you know, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to come of this second round of the, of the study. Um, a part of me is a little bit, um, is a little bit weary of studying the issue. Um, studies have been done for so over and over and over. Um, the, Catholic Biblical Association did a study of women uh, with a view toward ordained ministry three decades ago and found that there were no obstacles from scripture. The Catholic Theological Society of America same year did a similar thing. This was right after Inter Insignores came out. Um, so it's a, little, it's a little hard to be patient. I realize that 30 years is very short in uh, in church time, but um, it's a little hard to be patient and have yet another study when when it would appear that um, the study the study's been done. You know, now it's time to act on what the study is showing and to listen to the to the. Um, Listen, listen to what the church is saying. You know, I was so heartened with the uh, Amazonian Synod and um, it, it is so good that, that, the, that the desires of the heart are being expressed so clearly um, to those who have the power to change it. So, um, so I will say, Yes, I remain hopeful. Um, I, I, um, I was challenged by one of my Dominican sisters some years ago to stop saying, well, I know this is gonna happen in the church eventually, but probably not in my lifetime. And her challenge was quit saying not in our lifetime, quit saying it's gonna happen and work to make it so. so I think you know all of us have have ways in which we can work toward the structural changes. The relationship patterns, that's easier, you know, that's that's something we can have more control over. But the systemic change is the harder one. 
but all of us have all of us have areas of influence and all of us can use it and it's important i think to do so in uh in communion in community that um we have much more um ability to affect systemic change when we're able to act as one with a whole group together. Um, so I do think that there is always hope and that would be the note that particularly in an Easter season I would want us to end on and take away and not not to be discouraged but to um, embrace this season of transformation as a time when um, when uh, change is possible and sometimes in startling ways that we never expected sometimes it's a slow evolution and sometimes it is one dramatic moment where there's a huge breakthrough so however it comes um, maybe it will be both and thank you so much for that hope for the um rich excuse me here <laughs> for the rich uh, nourishment that you've given us and this Easter season, um, I love that notion of having feminist eyes, mind, and heart, and bringing that to our readings of scripture, whether that's in our homes, in our individual prayer, or when we gather with friends to kind of nourish one another. Um, it's really been a genuine pleasure to spend the past hour or so with you, learning from you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you who have joined us and engaged with our excellent uh, lecture tonight. Thank you to the Sisters of the Holy Cross who founded and continue to support the Center for Spirituality. Thank you to the donors who make this endowed lecture series possible and to the staff of St. Mary's College, campus and community events, IT and marketing for their logistical assistance. Before we close, we have one final announcement to make about next year's lecture. We are proud to announce that the 2022 Madaliva Lecture will be Dr. Elizabeth Schusler fiorenza of Harvard University. So thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.